Hello, everyone, in the American Chemical Society. Very pleased to uh, do this presentation today, virtually. So what we're talking about is a, a dynamic food and wine pairing model. How to pair food and wine. Uh, it's something I, I came up with about 40 years ago when I had just graduated from Yale. So the static model or the standard model, which is based on a static comprehension versus Craig Sheldon's dynamic model. The sense organs of the palate and all our other sense organs as well measure nothing on an absolute scale. All perception is relativistic. Unfortunately, the conventional thinking on food and wine pairing does not acknowledge this dynamic behavior of our sense organs, positing instead a rationale of identity. That is, if the wine and food share most of the same aromas, then it should work together. If there's a lot of vanilla in the wine and vanilla in the dish, allegedly it's supposed to work. It is therefore a static model. Recognizing the foundational errors of that standard model, I, I created an alternative model more than 40 years ago that's science-based. It's based in the, the, the physiology of the senses. Of course, as I took at Yale, Gordon Shepard. So the standard model posits a relationship of identity, as we said. If the wine and food share most of the same aromas, then the pairing should be successful. Okay? However, the dynamic model is different. It recognizes that all the sense organs responsible for taste and all of the chemical physical reactions, based on the seminal work of Yale professor Dr. Gordon Shepard, I was able to take a course on neurophysiology of the senses while an undergraduate at Yale. And the system applies first principles of neurophysiology to a lifetime of organoleptic experience and elucidates how various properties in the wine and in the foods interact dynamically. The neuroscience behind it can include biomechanics, physiology, and neuroscience, and even fluid dynamics. These neurological insights are coupled with basics of other traditional sciences, such as biology, chemistry, and physics. For example, some taste characteristics are subtractive. For example, acidity and sweetness. If you taste something sweet, for example, in, let's say, food, it is going to reduce the palate's perception of sweetness in the next thing that follows. This is true of acidity, sweetness. Some taste characteristics are additive, meaning with each encounter, the, intent, the intensity grows. A good example of that is, is tannin uh, and, and spice heat, like capsicum, seasoning, right? black pepper. And some things are interactive. Okay? Uh, example, astringency and spice or capsicum. So for example, if you have a, a very tannic red wine, you, you notice the level of tannin is strong. Now, if you go and say we're to interact with a, a spice like pepper, right, or some kind of hot chilies, they will further irritate and make the tannin wine feel even more tannic than it already is. Okay. Now, there are other one, there are other interactions that do exactly the opposite. This is a lot. Of, this is to me the body what's most important in marrying food and wine, not aromas. Okay. Let's call this the innate level of pairing. And then I would call the, the aromatic pairings as more cosmetic. Okay, so the foundational pairings. So neuroenology and how the brain creates the taste of wine. An analogy one can use is color. Right? The objects we see don't have color in and of themselves. Right? We talk about the Markov blanket. So it's, it, is a, it is sort of light. It sun bounces off and the light strikes our eyes that activates systems in the brain that create color from those different wavelengths. Similarly, the molecules in wine do not have taste or flavor in and of themselves. But when they stimulate our brains, the brain creates the flavor the same way it creates color. So bouquet and aroma. When you sniff wine in a glass, you appreciate the bouquet. And we're going to talk about orthonasal versus retronasal. Okay. So orthonasal is when you're breathing in, right? And retronasal is when it's coming from the mouth back up retro, right? Okay. And these are interesting. And, and, and it's, it's often been noticed, too, that different, you, you, each nostril has a different behavior in this regard. The effect saliva has on wine. 
Saliva contains enzymes that break down the molecules in the wine to create compounds that effervesce in the air to stimulate the cell receptors in your nose. This produces new compounds that were not originally in the wine. They were created by that interaction. And how subjective is taste? We all have about 350 different types of olfactory receptors and smell receptors. Probably 9% is the same, 10% is different. That's part of the pleasure of wine, comparing your, your pleasures to others. What can wine drinkers do to improve their tasting abilities? Okay. So the first thing I'd recommend is slowing down. In, in America, generally speaking, what happens is you know, people want to appear like they know what they're doing. So they get a glass of wine, and what is generally the first thing you see people do? They swirl it exactly. Okay? And we're going to just talk about this, why that is really not understanding what the swirl is about. Okay? So, most in America, we, we are fast-paced people, and we do everything in a hurry. You know, it's it's this, and then it's, you know, and then it's blood. Okay, so and, and then people tell me they can't taste wine. Well, of course you can. You're like a locomotive. If you're run, if you're in a if you're in a jet plane going hundreds of miles an hour, you can't pick out the the trees for the forest. The beginning of learning about wine is slowing down. And understand a few basic principles. So let me start with the life cycle of wine. Okay. The minute wine is made and put into a bottle, okay, we can call that birth. In the bottle, it's just gestating. Okay. Going through childhood, adolescence, and finally reaches a maturity. We call this the point at which the wine is as complex as it's ever going to get. Beautiful plateau now will go for a while, depending on the quality of the wine, is how long it may take to achieve that, that plateau. In fact, until Americans really got involved with creating these point scores, in the, the days before that, in 1980 and previously, you could say there was basically one and one only criterion for what determined the cost or the price of a wine would sell for. Okay? And it was year in, year out, in good vintages, how much aging potential does that wine have of increasing complexity before the decay starts? Or in other milestones when the plateau is just reached. So a wine that maybe will only mature for five years and then starts to fade. Might only be a, a, a five or ten dollar bottle. But a wine that can take 40, 50, 60 years to reach the beautiful plateau, that might be a thousand dollar a bottle. Okay. And, it, and it has just so much more complexity. Okay. We call that the life cycle. The birth, the development, adolescence, the beautiful maturity of the plateau, then the decay and death. And that death is defined when the changes are now de degradatory changes, changes of lower quality reduction, things like that. And bad aromas eventually start happening, and vinegar starts happening, right? Bad, you know, the bad acid. Okay? So we have to understand there's this something we call noble wines. Okay? It's a different kind of pairing from others. Noble wines are those I just described that have that long, 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 long aging period before they reach their beautiful plateau. Okay? And they are rare. And they are expensive. And so whatever you do, when you choose what food to serve with that wine, you never want that food to damage the taste experience of that wine. And yet, in most cases, most most restaurants and most households are doing the very thing that will make the experience the worst it can be. Okay? So you have to understand that when you think, especially in the old countries, in Europe, 
you have to understand that, that wine in and of itself doesn't make really much sense. Okay. Here in America, we've kind of atomized it. We have all these journalists who talk only about wine, not really ever about food. And we have a different set of journalists and writers who talk about food, and no one's talking about the interaction of the two. Okay. And my family in France, they would say, it's in America, it's like you have writers who write only books about men, and other writers who write only books about women, and nobody ha about what happens when they get together and have fun. So, let's talk about how to taste. So, you take any, any wine, and the, we're now going to address this thing. Okay. So, the still nose, without touching anything. Okay. Let's take this wine number one right in front of us. Okay. And don't swirl it. Just bring it right in front of you. Leave it still. Okay. And now what I want you to do is... Put your nose into the glass and breathe in as long and slowly a breath as you can possibly take. Train your muscles in your chest to enable a 30 second inhalation, even a one minute inhalation. That means you're going so slow. This means the, 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 the aromatic molecules in the wine are going to pass across your olfactory receptors much more slowly giving time for you to recognize the smells that are in there. And I don't need you to name them. That's just show off stuff. Okay. What I need you to do is just kind of memorize what you, that, let's just say, profile. that profile. Perfect. Okay. So basically, you know, and again, what's interesting too is if you tilt your head or you try one nostril versus the other, you're going to notice different things. And it's true, some people have more taste buds than others. I happen to be one of these people they call a super taster, right? And there's this little piece, it's like a, you know, a little acid tablet. They, they give you a little piece of paper. They put a droplet of this liquid on. I can't even remember what it is. And a lot of people have absolutely zero. They, they taste nothing, right? They taste nothing. And then there are some people who they get a little bit of an unpleasantness. And then there are people like me who for three days, I feel like vomiting. So it's so, I'm so sensitive to it. Okay. I, I assume, therefore, also there are some people who have a much higher amount of olfactory receptors than other people. I'm presuming that they may be one, kind of one and the same, but so let's just, you know, now I'm not going to, because, you know, I've done this all my life, so I, I'm just like, you, you'll notice I'm like, As an example, okay? I'm trying to memorize this profile. The still nose is the wine as it is today. It's a snapshot of the wine at this moment in its life history. Okay? Smell it and memorize it really doesn't tell you though where it is on that life cycle. Is it already on the plateau? Is it starting its decay? Is it just a baby? This, you can't tell that from either the swirled nose only or the still nose only. It's the difference between the two that is of utmost importance. In fact, if you were a wine buyer for a restaurant or a major industry merchant, you go into the cellars and there are hundreds of different casks for a single wine. Merceau Genevrier, right there. But there are 50 casks of it. And there's ma there can be massive variation from one cask to the next. Which one do you want to buy? So you would do this. You would take, they would give you a sample. You would memorize the still mouse. And now I start to swirl it. And if there are new smells, not just more intensity of the same smell, like when you take a rheostat and you turn the light up and down, it doesn't change the spectrum. 
It's just more intense or less intense, right? So swirling, though, is causing molecular chemical reactions to happen, right? It's aging the wine. It's like a fast forward button on a, on a, on a tape deck, okay? So this is how the wine is today, still. And this is how the wine will be in the future. Okay. Now, doing this 10,000 times with experience of all different types of wines, you will be able to make predictions like this wine has seven years left before it ages, it reaches that plateau, or this wine has, is already on the plateau, or this wine is already over the hill. Okay. So why don't you try? Why don't you try the still nose? Okay, and you think you have the, the smells there? Kind of a little bit of green fruit, maybe. The bear's hint of peach, maybe. It really doesn't matter, but they're pleasant notes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now if you start swirling heavy, and also this, at different heights, different compounds will appear. So this is why we also may, may smell from here and all the way. Okay, all the way down. So there are some times when, when, for certain wines, where I put my nose right touching, just touching the rim, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get things that have fallen, falling down. At any rate. So now, in my opinion, there's not a lot of difference between the world nose and the still nose, just more intensity. But not a lot of new things. Which is really surprising when you consider that this wine is very, very young, right? 2019 Chardonnay. Okay. But, the California style is typically to make, especially Chardonnays, Wines, the American style of winemaking has generally, gen, I'm speaking generalities here, generally intended to have them wines ready to consume when you buy them in the liquor store. Okay. Because not a lot of Americans had been, you know, the idea of laying down wines for decades in the cellar. When I grew up with my family in France, it was a ritual because my uncles had inherited generational wine collections. And every day for lunch, my uncle would take me, one of the uncles would take me down into the cellar and go to the white burgundy section. And we'd look at all these amazing Grand Cru. And then we'd do look today and I'd you choose Craig and I'd, I'd pull out, you know, a Le Mans Rocher, you know, 45 years old. <sighs> Blow the dust off it, right? And bring it upstairs and we'd show it. We must have did that. Or, you know, for dinner, that's when we did, of course, the Bordeaux's and the Red Burgundies and things like that. So the next level of testing for this delta, right, the change between the stills is we do it in the mouth, okay? So same thing as here. First, we're going to do the still mouth. Just put the wine in your mouth and leave it alone. Let it just be. Let it just gently warm up. And let the saliva interact with it just a little. So this is the whole idea of slowing down. And after I kind of now memorized that flavor, I'm getting a little kind of butteriness to it. You know. Then we'll do the aspiration. And we're going to Pay maximum attention to the difference between these two experiences. That was the still mouth, now the aspirate. What that is doing is agitating the wine with oxygen, right? Causing it, like again, to age prematurely. It's a fast forward button. And you, and you see, are there dramatic differences? Are you, are you getting new compounds and are they pleasant? Are you getting new compounds and they're unpleasant? Would be an indicator, Tom, that they're probably the one that's nearing the end of its life. Getting close. Does it all make sense? Give it a try. Soup to me. Now 
And another thing that's going on here is the comparison in the still nose, we were doing orthonasal. <coughs> in this way, we're doing retronasal. It's coming up from, <coughs> from the throat back up the sinus, the opposite direction. And different receptors, different things are generally activated. So right now, you know a lot about wine. With just that little information, you know a lot about wine. You also know a lot about how wines, how you could predict wines might have their qualities. Okay. Let's talk about latitude. What is the equator, the characteristic of the equator and the sun? Huh? Maximum heat at that point, pretty much, right? <laughs> and the farther you move away from the equator, it cools. Okay. So a wine made closer to the equator is going to have, receive more sunlight on the plant. The sunlight converts the chlor forces the chlorophyll to create sugar in the juice, the grape. So a hotter climate grape should have more blank than a cold climate. Sugar. More sugar. Okay. And sugar is what gets converted into alcohol by the microbes. So the more sunshine, the more sugar, and the more alcohol you should expect. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Alternatively, another way of looking at this is you need to reach a certain ripeness before you can make pleasant wine. Okay. In a hot climate, this happens in a shorter mm -hmm. period of time or a longer period of time? Shorter. shorter. In a cold climate, it takes longer, okay? All else being equal. The same type of grape, the same okay. elevation, the same aspect, and so forth, okay? Altitude is another one. Does it tend to be hotter or colder at high altitude? Cold, colder. Yes, <clears throat> absolutely, okay? So, a wine made at higher elevation will tend to be more like a cool climate wine, and a wine at low elevation will behave more like a hot climate wine. There's simple principles. Right? Proximity to water. Water is like a heat sink, which helps to modulate. It makes things milder. It helps to prevent wild swings. Okay? And so, the more modulation, the more consistent Generally, the finer the wine can be, all else being equal. Chateau Latour is notoriously one of the greatest wines every single year. So consistent, and, and it's not easy in Bordeaux because it's relatively cool in Bordeaux. Okay. This is where the more cool climate, the more easy or more likely there is to be a bad vintage. Okay? Because of weather, because of lack of sunshine. <clears throat> Not enough ripeness. There are lots of other things that could go wrong with wine, but I'm just talking about now the basics. So Latour is right on, right next has this 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 sort of river uh, stream running that ha that really helps to keep the the highs and lows modulated. Okay, soil structures, and that's going to go too deep today for this, but understand that. The quality of the soil, the drainage, uh, the mineralities, all that give a tremendous amount of influence on what the wine is going to taste like eventually. Okay? Let's talk about various patterns in food, too. We have basics, the basic characteristics of most food. Fat, right? sweetness, protein, umami, we often call it umami, uh, acidity, bitterness, astringency, and spice, the heat form of spice. Okay. So, pairing wine and food. Let me uh, stab one of us there. So, if you were to, in the classical days, when French cuisine was the pretty much the only thing considered truly, you know, elite in this country, in Europe, whatever, <clears throat> and there's a reason for that, which I'm going to get into in just a bit. But, um, 
So a classic dish we might have at lunch or dinner, oysters on the half shell, right? What a beautiful way to start a meal. And you would call the sommelier over and say, you know, what is the wine that we should order with, chef, with the oysters on the half shell? Invariably, they would say something like this, which is wine number two. This is a Chablis 2019. These two wines are one and two for a reason. This is the hot climate, Napa Valley, very hot, 2019, very young, and it's almost already on the plateau. Very little difference that I observed. What about you? In between the still and the swirl, the still mouth and the aspirated, right? This is the opposite. Chablis is part of Burgundy, which just runs a strip of north-south land along the river. And Chablis is a little piece detached from the rest, like the dot of an eye, way up here. Coldest climate place for Chardonnay north of the equator, where it can be still made as still wine. Doesn't have to, it's not so acidic for, because of so little sunlight that it has to be turned into sparkling wine. That's the case in Champagne. Even colder. So even more north even farther away from the equator. See how this is repeating? When we do this wine, wine number two, and they're labeled for you in case, you will see the numbers on the glasses in case. And let's try this one. The same, let's do the same experimentation as before. Still nose. Now the climate is so cold there, it, it, the hard part of Chablis is getting them ripe enough. So it could take 20, 40, 50 days longer than California to reach the level of sweetness. And long and slow cooking tends to make more complexity. Tends to. Okay? So that's one of the factors that to me makes a wine more interesting. A longer cooking time. Okay? To end, but you arrive at the same total amount of stuff. So what you probably notice about the Chablis is that it's this it's almost closed. There's not a lot there. Mm -hmm. Now, if we start swirling, you're going to definitely pick up new aromas that weren't there in the still nose. Things like butter and, and, and kind of like white fruit start to appear. Now let's try it in the mouth. Let's try the still nose, the, the still mouth. Okay, and you're gonna to start to see. All right, we're gonna come back to these and show how they interact with food. That's when it gets really exciting. Okay. So, the oysters on the half cell story. You see, Actually, let me do something in reverse. Let me come back to the oysters on the half shell after I first explain to you the dynamic pairing model. So, if we were to have a food that's highly acidic, remember I mentioned earlier, it's going to reduce our perception of acid in the thing that follows. So why don't we do that? We're going to go back to wine number one, okay. and we're going to bite into the lemon. Now try to get the lemon juice everywhere inside your mouth, under your lips, under your tongue, the cheeks, the roof of the mouth, everywhere, so that it's uniformly sets a new reference standard, if you will. Mm -hmm. The high degree of acidity in this food is now going to reduce our perception it's going to make negative the acidity, right? It's going to reduce the perception of the acidity in here. Is this wine now going to be balanced or imbalanced? Given that it's already on the plateau, almost all food can do the best it can do is leave it alone. But once you put something that's physiologically active, gustatorily active, it probably is only going to hurt it. And I bet you this is going to hurt it badly. Right? Becomes disgusting. Mm -hmm. 
thins out, and now it's all like this, this really harsh wood, right? Flat. Flat. Yeah. And, and so that acidity, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens if we did the opposite? What if we took sugar? Okay. Now, here's a good time, if you want, at any time, to recalibrate your palate. Eat a little white bread. Best thing to do it. And it's a recalibration. Or, you know, a little water. But let's instead here do this into the sugar. Okay. And rub it around everywhere like the same thing. Move it all around. Okay. Now, being a warm climate wine, it's likely to have a lot of sugar, residual sugar. So much sugar in the juice that it couldn't all be turned into alcohol. The alcohol reaches 14, 15%. It kills the yeast cells themselves. Mm -hmm. And then it, they, they just can't go any further. Okay. You might be, you know, so now let's taste this. The high degree of sugar is going to reduce our perception of the inherent, the ontic level of sugar in here. And this is going to be, I guarantee, even worse. Yeah. Cooking wine. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, I'm really sensitive. But isn't that disgusting? Now, it's interesting that that wine is so good alone, without food that is either high in sugar or high in acid. Okay. Let's try that same experiment with the Chablis. Okay. Take a piece of bread first. Let's do that so we have it. Now, can you pass me one too, please? Thanks, buddy. Do this to kind of cleanse it now. We've got a new reference point here. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's taste this wine again, number two, by itself. We remember it's kind of closed and tight. Now, let's do that lemon, the lemon test. Now, if you will, the problem with this wine, it's not on the plateau. So it cannot be a noble pairing situation. The flaw, if you will, in this wine is that it's too young. The European style of winemaking, especially in the best vineyards, is they're designed van de garde. Wines to keep. Where it's what you treasure is the idea that this wine might have 20 years of aging potential. And you patiently wait to reach that day. In fact, that's the primary job of a sommelier. In a let's grab a state. He is supposed to know where every one of the, you might have 500 different wines in the cellar, and he has to mentally calibrate where each one of those wines is, is in an aging scale. So if the master of the house, if the, if the duke is at home, and your job is to bring what? The worst bottle of wine in the cellar, or the, the one that's at the peak, the one that's at the most beautiful expression it'll ever be. You don't want to wait on that. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to go past that. You haven't done your job. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to serve and, and destroy the wine before you reach there. You're not doing your job. Now, the number one thing in the, you know, in, the, in these in those days, what they had to know, they knew where each wine is on its life cycle. Okay. So, a noble parent is when you bring forth that bottle when it is on the plateau or just about. Depends on the kind of an owner. Now, if the Duke is a hedonist who rabbalizingly gulps down his wine, like Bob over here, <laughs> you're going to want to bring the wine already fully at the, it's on the plateau, right in the middle. But if you have a cerebral Duke like Tom, you're going to want to bring the wine a little bit before that plateau, just a little bit, so that he can contemplate it and watch it open in the glass. Because you see, wine is like a beautiful moving picture, whereas an alcohol, like a scotch, is a beautiful portrait. Get it? Mm -hmm. So, 
Are we ready to do the lemon test with this wine? Have you done it yet? Yep. Okay, so the high degree of acidity in the mouth is going to reduce your perception. Put some more wine in here. And too high in acidity is the quality, the, the bad quality of a wine that's too young. What happens is you will taste more fruit now. The wine gains mass. It feels thicker. It feels like, magically, I aged this wine five or six years. That's true. Yeah? It's true. Fascinating, right? Yes. It's like magic. No, That's it's amazing. science, okay? It's chemistry, it's physics, it's biology. Hmm. On the other hand, if we try the sugar experiment here, it's going to be a disaster. Because the, pro the flaw of this wine is too very cool climate, it struggles to get enough sugar, to have enough alcohol to be a serious, to be a real wine, you know? So if you try the sugar now, you'll see this is a very bad pairing. It's not as bad as the California wine reacts to sugar, but it's still not good, right? Do it a second time, some more, because, you know, we, we still have some acidity left over from that last. Mm -hmm. Make sure you eat every drop. And you see, clearly not better, right? It almost exaggerates the flaw of the wine being too young. All right, so now we can talk about noble pairings. A noble wine situation is when the following things happen. It comes from a piece of soil that has been recognized as producing great wines in great vintages consistently for years and years and years. So it wasn't screwed up in that year by the weather. Okay. It was vinified. The man or woman who made all the decisions in making the wine, crushing the grapes, fermenting it, all those decisions didn't, didn't screw it up either. Okay. And then it was stored correctly. Didn't screw it up with bad storage. What can screw it up? Shaking, light, Temperature fluctuations, or too high or too low, right? All can mess it up before it even leaves the winery. Then transport it correctly. Okay. All of these things have to get right. And not only that, and serve at the correct time when it is right at that cusp or on the plateau. If any one of those things didn't happen right, it cannot be called technically a noble pairing because there is a flaw in the wine. But if all those things did happen, I call it a noble pairing. This is as good as the wine is ever gonna get. It's on or right at that plateau. That's the maximum complexity, the maximum beauty. In these cases, we wanna do food pairings that are neutral, that are not high in acid or sweetness or spice or other certain chemicals unique to certain foods like asparagus has cyanara in it. A compound that, that, that will make, will destroy almost any one, raw or choke especially, okay? So going back to this old, the Duke, okay? The Duke of Devonshire here, very cerebral. <laughs> the Duke of Essex over here, rebel is you. The Duke over here says, his chef has one and only one job. What do you think it is, Andrew? Now this man can afford anything in the world. Anything. Mm. So what are you going to get for him? Everything. The best thing that you can find. You're not going to bring him the second best thing you can find. He's the Duke. Right? So you're scouring the markets, you found the most beautiful turbo you've ever seen in your life, you know what you're serving him tonight. Okay? You never bring him anything but the very best. 
Isn't that also the Somalian's job? Correct. Now, you don't know anything about this scientific stuff about the wine and food pairing. Nobody ever taught it to you, because this is 200 years ago, 300 years ago. Okay? So you take that turbo, and all you can think about is, how do I make this the best turbo dish of your life for the dude? Correct? Mm -hmm. You don't know whether you should use sugar or no sugar, acid, no acid, pepper, no pepper, artichokes, no artichokes. You just make something you're inspired to, okay? And let's just say you made a dish of turbo with artichokes and tomato sauce with a lot of vinegar and a certain go, 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 okay? And you put this in front of the Duke. And the sommelier comes over and he pours the very special wine. And the, the, the Duke tastes the wine. And Duke says, this is lovely. <laughs> and then he eats the dish, and he goes back to the wine. And he gets angry. And he yells at the sommelier, what's wrong with you, fool? The wine is bad. The wine is terrible. And you're the one who takes the shit. But it was his fault. <laughs> but nobody knew why. They just knew it happened. And over the course of centuries, if you will, Rules were made about what you cannot serve with noble wine. And this collection of dishes and rules became known as classical French cuisine. And it's actually a misnomer. It really shouldn't be called uniquely French. Because it was the cuisine of wine connoisseurs anywhere in the world. Anyone who collected these great first growths, these great ground crews, whether they were from France or Italy or Germany, whatever, or Spain, you knew that if it was one of these noble wines at or near its peak, you serve classical French cuisine because it's the only cuisine designed to be physiologically neutral. That's why you don't serve salad until after the red wines are finished. Because what's in salad? that would harm the red wine. What is it? Vinegar. Thank you, vinegar. You don't see anything sweet in any course until dessert because sugar would do what? It would destroy, like it did this California wine, is actually similar to a noble pairing, right? Because it's already on the plateau. And I got there real quick because of a lot of differences of a hot climate and certain decisions that were made in the vinification, the harvesting. The entire decision tree was so that this wine would be basically ready to drink and already perfect at its peak. Not that complex. Pretty simple, a good cocktail party wine. Okay. This Chablis, on the other hand, is not designed to be ready to drink the moment it's in the bottle. It's a 2019. This probably needs eight years before it reaches that. But when it gets there, it's going to have so much more than this wine has today. So, you go back to the oyster story. So you would ask any sommelier, what is the perfect wine to pair with the oysters on the half shell? And he's going to, almost certainly going to say this wine right here. A young village Chablis the coolest climate Chardonnay from the old world, certainly north of the equator. Now, the interesting thing is it works, but it has almost nothing to do with the, of the oyster. The reason that pairing is great has nothing, almost nothing to do with the oyster, but that's not, they'll tell you, oh, you know, you know, you know it's, the sea seashells that were in the soil makes the cows care, and it makes the smell of the seashell, and that's why it works. Wrong. It's a lovely thought. It's poetic, but it's not true. The reason this works is because what is the classic condiment we serve with oysters on the half shell? Mignonette. Mignonette, which is pure vinegar, or lemon, which is high, high acidity. So the real pairing that's going on in that dish is the lemon and the wine, not the oyster and the wine. The lemon in the wine is waking up this way too young. It's, it's tricking the palate and making this wine appear to be more aged than it actually is. Interesting, right? If you're a purist like me, I don't like lemon or 
meeting it at with my oysters, right? The reason that all started was because of what? We didn't have refrigeration <laughs> years ago, you know? And the oyster, back here. the oyster might be, you know, not perfectly fresh, douse it in the vinegar and pray for the best. Okay. And then it became, like, accepted as a norm. Strange, right? Okay. <laughs> But for, if, if I'm going to go out there and buy the most beautiful and most expensive oysters on, on planet, then I'm going to just eat them pure and natural. Therefore, this would be the wrong choice. What might be the right choice is a Grand Cru Chablis with 25 years on it, on the plateau. Why? Because the oyster itself is, is neutral. It's not harsh in acidity, is it? It's not full of sweetness, it's not sugary, it's not spicy. It doesn't have anything in there that was, you know, really is going to harm a noble wine. Okay. <clears throat> Talk about the next set of wines. Here we have two more, Char two more Chardonnays, okay, and number three <coughs> is another Napa, but this time it's 2017. Really ripe, meaning this is not for this wine, this is really fully on the plateau, okay? Whereas this, it says Bourgogne Blanc from Jean-Michel Gonu, 2017. So we're looking now at wines with a little more age. These were 2019. These are both 2017. But this is declassified Merceau. Wine, well, Merceau is one of the great, greatest Chardonnays on the planet. Very feminine, rich, voluptuous, and usually in in the first and the, 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 the Grand Cruz and, and the Premier Cruz, these things can age usually 20, 30, sometimes 40 years. So number three is the is the California. You're going to feel it that once again the same thing. The difference between the still nose and the swirled nose is not dramatic. In fact, you may see no difference. I see no difference at all in the two noses. If anything, if there's any new smells in this, in the, in this aspirated nose, to me, they feel like they're bad. This wine is, is getting close to the edge of going over. Tom will not like this. Thanks. <laughs> but Bob will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's do the lemon test. Interesting thing because if you were to tell me what are your impressions of California cuisine, what are the hallmark characteristics of it? High acidity, high sugar, high spice, everything you shouldn't have for California wine that's already at the plateau. It's like the, to me the most perfect wrong cuisine for the wines of the same region. When I think of California wines, you know, especially if they're on the plateau, if they're there, it's like that's the it should be like classical French cuisine. We'll flatter the wine so much more. Okay. Now let's go to number four. Oh wait, no, you didn't do the sugar test yet. I'll let you guys do it. I don't. I'm not gonna put myself through. It. You love that? <laughs> Look at the face. <laughs> Painful. Kills it. Yeah. Now you can imagine how easy it is to take a $500 bottle of wine and turn it into a 50 cent experience. Okay? 
You're on that mailing list for some Helen Turley Chardonnay. Or you have some Lumon Rocher DRCs. Could be seven thousand dollars a bottle with twenty-five years of age on it, easily. And then you serve something like this, a really heavy acidic and sugary dish, and you've just completely ruined it. Okay, now let's try it. instead. Take a piece of that bread again. Okay, have mercy. Pain doesn't have to last forever. Almost tasted court. Right? But it's not court. Because you knew the wine was good. Wines don't get court during the meal. I can tell you, this happened more than 2,000 times at the Ryland Inn. Customers would talk to me when I go out to the table. They'd ask for wine recommendations. And they would say to me, you know, Mr. Sheldon, we were in a restaurant just the other day and we ordered a very expensive bottle of wine and it went bad during the meal. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people told that. And I said, you know, I don't want to tell them that's not possible. If it's good, it doesn't go bad. What happened is they counseled you to have the absolutely wrong food for that wine. Uh -huh. Yeah. Huh? Um, next. So let's do number four. This is a lovely wine. This is basically a Marcel. They made too much that year, and they had to declassify it by law. You're only allowed a certain number of, let's say, gallons per year per acre. If you go more than that, you have to sell it as a lesser wine. So this, instead of being $60 a bottle, we got for about 20 What's the difference between the still nose and the swirl nose? Do you feeling more things coming out or a lot more coming out? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's dramatic. This wine has at least 15 years, I think, of aging left. Glorious. Again, let's do the lemon test, do the sugar test, see what you think. While it hasn't become disgusting, it's not as good. It's not as unpleasant as that California wine was by any stretch. Because that high climate also produces more tannin, even in the whites. Bitterness. But it's masked by sugar, because there's so much more sugar. And that's one of the balancing acts of the winemaker, to balance the bitterness, the stringency with the sugar, to balance the acid and the alcohol, make it nice. Mm -hmm. I could drink that even now, even with acidic food, it would just be, it's not sex anymore. This is, I don't know, TV. <laughs> and there's some good TV, but now let's try the sugar test. This will be more destructive to the wine than the acid was. The reason is the Merceau, I mean, the Merceau has a lot of acidity in it, even though it's got some age. But not a lot of sugar. I probably zero residual sugar in this wine. So they struggle to get the ripeness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This makes the wine totally thin, like water, like oaky water, maybe. Yeah. No interest anymore. This isn't even TV. Mm. All right. Now let's move to red wines because we introduced one new thing here, right? The tannin. You close your eyes, you could still probably tell this is a red wine if I served it to you blind because of the tannin. Now we've got two here. Number five is this. 
This is a California Cabernet Sauvignon from 2018. Young. This should be very... So the tannins are worse the younger the wine is. The more unpleasant, the younger the wine. As the wine ages, the tannins become softened. Okay. This is what dries your mouth out with that astringent. You see the tannin. So, let's try this wine. Still nose. There's an off-putting aroma to it, isn't there? There's something that's not the, the trend of it. That's almost a smoke like a cardboard. Pencil shape. Yeah. Yeah. Or pencil shading, where that cedar note is classic Cabernet or Bordeaux, you know, those those wines. One of the classic aromas. But there's something kind of funky, a little bit like cardboard on it. Okay, and anyway. Still versus swirled. So you've memorized the aromas here, and now you start to swirl. And here's where you can use more and more. You could try a soft swirl, see what you get. And then a, a faster swirl, see what you get. And that's like, you know, on most remotes, when you have a fast forward button, you can, you can fast forward at speed two. Or you can fast forward to speed four, or fast forward to speed 32. You're doing the same thing. You're, you're deciding how far into the future you want to peak. Are there new aromas that are coming out? Are new smells you can, you can identify? Or does it seem mostly the same? To me, there's a small... Fruity difference, a little bit. Maybe this wine has another one year of aging capability, but it's it's been designed to be able to be drunk when you buy it in the liquor store as young as it is. Okay? Let's try the, the same thing, the mouth. Still mouth, swirl the mouth. Honestly, I don't get much difference. Do you? Once again, that's why this is a good wine for a cocktail party. Wine when you're not eating food. It's already balanced. Mm -hmm. It's good the way it is. That smell is going to blow off that, that little off. I remember, I'm hypersensitive. You, you might not even get it. Um, that's going to blow away. The wine is good. The wine is intact. The wine is not corked or anything like that. But this, to me, is basically cocktail party. It's inoffensive. <laughs> Best thing I'd probably say about it. Now we're going to come to something truly special. This Chateau de Roque got a 97 score, I think, from Decanter Magazine, which is Britain's greatest wine rating Yet, it's only about $25 a bottle, maybe even less. Okay. Now, I'm telling you, first growth Bordeaux don't always get 97s. They can be 1000 2000 a bottle. This wine has stuff going on. Okay. This is group sex. Okay. <laughs> So still knows. Mucho new things. This is a wine for the Duke of Devonshire. This is going to open for an hour. Let's now talk about something. Both of these wines have a little bit of tannin. And maybe it's not off-putting in these two selections. This wine is very strong in tannin, which I have saved it for later. Now, there are, there are five things that will reduce the perception of tannin. 
and they are fat, acidity, protein, enzyme, and sweetness. And blue cheese has all of them. So what I want you to do is to take some blue cheese. Let's go first, go back to wine number five. Can you feel how it is a little bit of dries your, your tongue out, right? Mm -hmm. So let's dip our fingertip into the pepper. Rub the pepper on your tongue and as far as everywhere else you can. That's irritating those taste buds. Now the wine is going to taste more tannic, or another way of putting it, even younger than it is. Mm -hmm. Notice it's much harsher now, right? Oh, yeah. Much harsher. Do it a second time. Hmm. It keeps building. Now it's unpleasant. Yes? And what is the first thing they're going to offer you in most restaurants when your entree served? Would you like some pepper on your dish? Hmm. Right? The illogic of it. Now how do you like it? Now how do you like me? You don't like me. Now you're going to love me. So blue cheese has all of the things that neutralize or reduce the perception of tannin. So let's take a piece of blue cheese and let's do the same. Smash it, mash it everywhere inside, under the tongue, behind the lips, cheeks, mm. roof of mouth, everywhere. This is Roper. Man, it's good. Okay. Now... You go back to the wine, it's going to be soft. The tannins are going to be like this wine, just aged 10 years magically in front of your eyes. Let's do this. Eat a piece of bread to help cleanse the palate of that pepper. And I recommend rubbing it of bread even to some degree. Now let's do another piece of blue cheese. Make sure you get a lot of that blue in there. That's the enzyme part, right? Delicious, right? Now this wine is going to be as if we aged it 10 years. Lovely. Much better, right? Smoother, but not so interesting either. Because this wine doesn't really have anything to give beyond this year, next year. Hmm. We're taking it to a place it doesn't want to go. <clears throat> Let's try this experiment with the with wine number six, the Bordeaux. The wine that is clearly in adolescence, nowhere near the plateau. I take another piece of bread, cleanse the palate a little. Another taste, still and, and aspirated. Let's try the pepper test. Back to the wine. Those tannins are harsher, but they're still pretty soft. Mm -hmm. compared to the California wine, right? Mm -hmm. Not nearly as aggressive. Am I wrong? Yeah, no. It's to be expected. It's a cooler climate. Mm -hmm. Now, there can be massive variation from one piece of soil to the next. There can be massive variation because of altitude, because of whether or not you have a river nearby or a piece of body of water to modulate. You get me. But all else being equal, we would kind of expect it. Now let's do the rope for, because it's starting, I'm starting to feel it. I'm starting to feel the drying out of my mouth, right? I'm going to do it twice because the rope is the rope, the rope insanely good, right? Mm. Oh. Mm. Mm. See how beautiful that is? That 
that there is a magical transportation, how this wine will be in about eight, nine years. With softer tannins. Don't you feel more fruit coming out of it now? Which I'm not, you know, I'm not suggesting. I mean, it's really there. It's not as harsh. Yeah. So, how do we pair food and wine using these principles? First, we decide which is the variable. Do we already have a dish that we're committed to and we have to pick a wine? Or do we have a wine and we're going to pick a dish? Okay? And so the thinking is identical except inverse in those two situations. Let's presume we have a wine. Since we don't like this wine that much anyway, let's do this. <laughs> Right? Everybody do that. Take wine number five and pour it into number four. Then, let's take some of this. Why? Because it's there. <clears throat> this is a very, very high-rated Bordeaux blend from Argentina. Zozal. The ego. The ezo. Pour that into glass number five that you just emptied. This has much more tin. It is a classic Bordeaux in that it has the four or five different grapes of Bordeaux. Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, etc. Now let's taste this. It's a beautiful nose, Ooh. right? You'd be thinking you're drinking a serious bottle of Bordeaux here. I think this is a 95, 96 score. It's a very high, it's, it's a overachiever wine. Again, underpriced, overachieving. The still nose is glorious, but the swirl nose is out of this world, right? This has more tannin to it, in my experience. I haven't tasted it recently. Mm. Mm. Do the pepper test. How many more minutes do we have? 10 15. 10 15? Okay. Good. Perfect. I'm going to stop this one here. Now it's one. getting. Ooh. That's interesting. Right. That's. That's pretty peppery. Yeah. Pretty harsh. Pretty, mm -hmm. right? Still enjoyable, though. Mm -hmm. But now let's do that blue cheese. Mm -hmm. I hope you still have some, right? Yeah. <laughs> Trying to. All right. The tannin is almost evaporated, right? It's almost not there. And all that's remaining is beautiful fruit, clean, glorious, balanced. Very nice. Again, yeah. it's like a magical fast forward button. <laughs> Seven, eight years, in my in my estimation. Okay. So let's talk about what you've all learned here. We have one of two situations as far as the wine is concerned. Either it is a noble situation, that is the wine. Passed all the tests. It was made from a good vineyard, the right way, blah, 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 transported correctly, stored correctly, and it's somewhere either just about or on the plateau. Noble situation, wines number one and wines number three. Both were Californians. Mm -hmm. To some degree, even wine number four. Not five. I can't remember. Five, yeah. Which was the Ramsey, right? The Ramsey. Whichever the that was. I think it was four, right? Four. Yeah, the four. These are all wines that were at their plateau. In that case, we want to do a noble pairing. That is, we don't want any food that will damage, that will interact, that will change our palate's perceptions. We don't want spicy. We don't want high acidity. We don't want sweetness. That is going to unbalance our perception of the wine. It's going to make it 
perceived to be unbalanced, even though it isn't. And which was worse, the high acidity or the high sugar? In wine number one. Kind of a toss-up. They both sucked. It was terrible, right? <laughs> in wine number three, which was this. Was it worse to have the sugar or the acid? Do you remember? It was equally bad, I think. Equally bad. Maybe the sugar was worse because it really exposed the high levels of tannin in the wine. Even worse. So when we have that, when we have said to ourselves, this wine is a serious wine. There's a lot in there. But there's a lot going on. It's beautiful. It's complex. But when I swirl it, nothing that much new happens. And when I aspirate it in the mouth, nothing that much new happens. That's your signal. We're dealing with a noble pairing situation. The wine is not only made correctly from a nice piece of soil, blah, 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 but it's also at its right age. Maximum complexity. We want to leave the wine alone. Try to create a dish that observes the precepts of classical French cuisine. No high acidity. I mean, a drop of lemon juice is not a problem, but right, that is. You get me? A drop of vinegar isn't a problem in the sauce, but that is. You, you see? Okay. And those rules that seemed arbitrary to you before that they talk about in France, like we serve salad after the clarets. Well, that's how British eat. I guess you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after the clarets. That now makes sense to you. No sweetness in appetizers. It now makes sense to you if you're going to serve fine wine at its noble wine on its, its, its reach. Its but this is a very rare occasion in the world today that you have a noble pairing. Because it's expensive. <laughs> If you're not the one laying, if your father or grandfather didn't lay down the wine for you, it takes a lot of patience and money to wait until we shall serve no wine before it's time. That's that thing. It's very, very expensive in restaurants. So it's not what happens most of the time. What happens most of the time, I'll call it A peasant style pairing. And I know that has an awful snobbish connotation. Guilty as charged. No, no, I don't mean it like that. What I mean is this the peasants didn't have the money to lay down wine. Okay? They had to do with whatever it was they got. You got the grapes of the whatever group in your area wild or whatever. You made your wine and you were going to drink it within the year or next year at the most. Okay. So it automatically has some kind of a flaw. Okay. Technically speaking, it's too young. It's not perfectly balanced. But you can use food a flaw in the food to make invisible the flaw in the wine. And if it really works, the flaw in the wine makes invisible the flaw in the food. <laughs> These are the classic pairings you heard about throughout the regions. Spaghetti and meatballs with Chianti. The high degree of acidity in the Chianti disguises, makes invisible the high degree of acidity in the tomato sauce. The high degree of, of acidity in the tomato sauce disguises and makes invisible a high degree of acidity in this young Chianti. And suddenly, a wine that is eh, and a dish that is eh, <laughs> no. becomes a dish that is a wow, and a wine that is wow. Okay? But this has always been done previously by trial and error. 50 million dishes were tried before that one or two or three things that would work with that. Okay. So when we are dealing with what I call, you know, more of a peasant type of wine situation, 
Well, that was all of these others. The Laroque is too young. The, Ag the Ego is too young. The Merceau Bourgogne Blanc was too young. And the Chablis is too young. In, the, in this case, technically, they behave like a peasant that is the wine as a flaw. Even if it's only that it's just too young, the wine is flawed. So when the wine is too young, white wines, we can use acid to disguise that fact, to make invisible the flaw. Okay? We can use any of the things in blue cheese, fat, acid, sweetness, enzyme, and protein to reduce the flaw of the red wines too young. Okay? You're beginning to see the pattern. The principles. But now let me make it easy. There's a cheat sheet. The cheat sheet. Once you start to learn a little bit about cuisine from around the world, starting with the old countries that have had wine. The greatest one to learn from is France. Okay. The most varied types of cuisines possibly. And the most varied, again, for wine, number one. Right. In the following way. Suppose you're in a situation where you're being served a Gewurztraminer. Gewurztraminer, right? It's a, it's, but it's from California. What the hell am I going to do with this? <laughs> well, first of all, you're going to say to yourself, still nose, swirled nose, is it where on its life curve? Where it's really young. What's your, what's your remedy for really young? Acid, remember? Some sort of acid in the dish. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. Then you're going to say to yourself, where in the old countries is Gewürztraminer found? Germany. Germany. France and Germany. Germany. Okay. So you think of the cuisine of Alsace. And you say to yourself, what do they serve in Alsace with Gewürztraminer? I don't have to make that dish, but there's something they discovered through trial and error. Okay. Munster cheese, a classic, whatever. You, you start to learn, okay? Supposing you have a Chardonnay. Still nose, swirl nose, nearly identical. Lots going on. Peasant dish, a peasant pairing, or a noble pairing, which? Noble. Noble, noble. noble. precisely. The Duke's <laughs> favorite thing. So, where do they make Chardonnay? in the old country at its finest. Burgundy. I'm going to go to Burgundy. What kind of dishes do they serve in Burgundy? Well, it could be things like a roast chicken with roast veg. Nothing high acid or sugar, just all kind of gentle. Okay? That seems to me like the thing. You see what I'm saying? You have a wine, it's Syrah. Shiraz, same thing. Okay, where in France do they serve Syrah? Southern Rhone, principally. What kind of food in the Southern Rhone? Tomato, onion, garlic, art, right? All those things. Okay. Is it still no swirl nose the same or big difference? Big difference? Peasant. What are we going to do to make the wine feel younger? To erase the flaw? Acid. High acid or high sweetness or high, right? Protein, enzyme, etc. Mm -hmm. Now you're beginning to see how it all interweaves, right? And honest to God, you now have, you're now equipped to pair food and wine. Actually, you have a scientific model in 90 minutes that's probably more reliable. What it took sommeliers in most restaurants, 30, 40 years of basically just rote memorization of what works through trial and error. Remember, think about this. We said originally the Western model for pairing food and wine is association of identity. A lot of vanilla in the dish, we should want a lot of vanilla in the wine. Hold on to that point. Hold on to that thought for a second. What is the theory of cuisine in India? That no two things should be the same, right? 
If you have five elements on, they have to have maximum contrast. That's how they make great food in India. And by the way, the food in India is great. But so is the food in the West. So neither of these theories can be correct. They cancel each other out, don't they? You can't have identity and contrast, either exclusive. Right? So they're both wrong. They're both full of shit. Okay. What is going on here is, first and foremost, we have to find food that doesn't damage the sense organ's ability to deal with the wine favorably. In the case of a wine that has a flaw, we want to trick the palate a little bit. Minimize that flaw. When the wine doesn't have a flaw, noble situation, we want to be natural. We want the food to not affect the palate at all. So, who has some questions? Or should we just get to drinking? <laughs> awesome. Drinking and cheating. Awesome. Great. Seriously, any questions? Great, great, great. Can you did you try this ego with uh, with the lemon test? Did you try it with the blue cheese? Do you we remember? Try it with the blue was it, we didn't try it with the blue cheese, did we? Blue cheese, we well, let's it. make sure we pass this around. <laughs> Good five. wine, not go to waste. Yeah, yeah, five. Five. Well, I think five we poured into number five. Number I think five. Yeah. Ladies, we're gonna have a little uh, red wine and blue cheese. Come on, do you want? Come on. Sure. There's everything to taste. Now, so the blue cheese is. <clears throat> Question about salt level and whether salt is a sensation or taste that affects. Oh my God, I'm so happy you mentioned salt. <laughs> and I'll tell you this: in every kitchen I was ever in, the finest in the world, generally, at an exact moment of the night, suddenly dishes would come back. Even at Robichon. <laughs> now, see if you can understand why. You already know the answer, you just haven't put it together. Salt is one of those things that is subtractive. You taste some salt right now, it is going to reduce the perception of salt in the next thing you taste. If the next thing has salt in it, it'll reduce it again. So what's happening is that cooks are seasoning and tasting. Seasoning and tasting. And their threshold of perception of salt keeps mm -hmm. rising, right? It takes more and more salt for them to say it tastes good. No one, you know, chefs are ever trained in the physiology of the senses. Neither are they trained in diet, science, how it relates to disease, right? So, the first thing is, this ludicrous statement, you will see in almost every recipe ever printed, season to taste. <laughs> if that is not the most insane thing ever written, it is a perfect expression, it is, it is perfectly wrong. Because your taste buds are not reliable. They are incredibly sensitive to delta, the difference between this and what I just tasted before. But they're moving. The reference point is moving all over the place. Nobody told the cooks, listen, you have to use that bread or that water and rinse and recalibrate to zero. Instead, it's going like this. Escalation. Escalation. <clears throat> okay? So I told my crew, and I came up with this theory, this hypothesis rather. I said to myself, what is the purpose? Why salt, salt, salt? So, and I said, I think it's because it activates the salivary glands. Not, I don't believe that the, the salivary glands threshold of activation changes with exposure because it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't serve the function. It's the beginning of the digestion process. So I taught my cooks, and even at Boule, number one restaurant in America when I was the chef there, big dishes came back. And I, Ryland and I told my cooks a different hypothesis. I said, well, I don't want you to taste to make your decision. I want you to watch 
the salivary glands. You season, you can't taste the salt, fine. A little more, whatever. But the minute you feel the rush of saliva, you stop. You want to know what the outcome of that was? Whereas we used to have 10, 20 dishes a night in every restaurant I ever worked in, New York City, the greatest, France, at a certain time of the night, at Ryland, we averaged one dish a year come back for seasonal problems. Once the theory was correct. <laughs> what is the point? The point of salt is to activate the salivary glands, which begins the digestion which breaks down long, complex, if you take that piece of bread right now, right? Starch, what is starch? Like a long necklace of pearls. Each pearl is a sugar molecule. You take raw flour in your mouth, put it there. Disgusting, right? No flavor. You leave it there long enough, piece of bread, it becomes sweet. Eventually, it's nothing but sugar. Bread is nothing but sugar. It's just strings of sugar molecules that are so long, they can't, Taste the sugar, right? But enzymes in your saliva are chemical scissors, enzymes that cut long molecules that have mild or hidden flavor into smaller and smaller molecules that actualize the potential flavor, in, right, into actuality. How's that? Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yeah, the bread. I was wondering about that. It's, I mean, it it's pretty seem, remarkable, right? Well, no, it doesn't seem neutral as an item. Like, it does have a lot of sugar, and then sourdough is a lot of acid, obviously. Yes, yes. And it's still. Well, there's something I think more mechanical about it, kind of sort of like uh, wiping, uh, almost wiping the the uh, pap papilla yeah. with your tongue. Clean. <laughs> And again, I, I haven't even really thought, I'm so glad you asked that question. I've never really considered it before how it does it. I just knew it did it. It just feels like it does it. But I, I love questions like this. And, and, and more than anything else, I love being wrong. <laughs> because there's no quicker way to learn than when somebody shows me why I'm wrong. You know? It's like, it would take me nine years to get to that thing where if somebody just, hey, Craig, you know, you didn't read this that paper and, uh, well, shit, let me read it. You know, wow, brilliant, right? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know why. Honestly, I don't know why it seems to work. But everyone I know has that same response. It seems to work. Anything else? Is there a particular dish made of the plants that has uh, the best resiliency towards any discrepancy in wine, whether noble, not noble, white or red? Let me reverse it on you. What is the one wine that you can serve with almost anything? Champagne. Sparkling wines, because of the residual sugar, the carbonic acid in the minerals, seems one of the hardest things to pair is hot soup. Just, I don't mean spicy, I mean just hot, the temperature. Because it, it really disequilibrates. So we usually will serve something like Gabay, like a Beaujolais, with that. Okay, so again, these are all great questions. So, I mean, I'm sorry to turn it inverse to you. What was like the one food? Well, that roast chicken mm. will never offend any dish, but it won't necessarily bring out heal problems, and, yeah. right? Disguise the Mass problems. the forms. Okay. Thank mm. you. And thank you to the American Chemical Society fellows.